my name is uh, Rob Nicholson. I'm a social entrepreneur from Northeastern Ohio, and I'm a little bit pissed off. I love all your organizations, but what I want to know is, how are you developing content and programs to teach tomorrow's leaders to be not just entrepreneurs, but social entrepreneurs? And I say I'm pissed off because in 10 years, if you guys don't respond to that call, I will. <laughs> I can speak, since I have the mic, I'll, I'll pass it on in a second. I can speak for our organization. We, we hold specialized entrepreneurship tracks and uh, conferences for our students, and social entrepreneurship is a part, a track within those programs, and is frankly one of the most popular areas that we have. Well, as I mentioned uh, a little earlier around Lemonade Day, part of that process is once the kids have made their product and sold it during the day, they're asked to do three things. Uh, and that really is to show the youth the whole life cycle of how it works. Um, capitalism and free enterprise is an incredible thing, and, and it gives you the opportunity to buy stuff and to live to the standard at which you're willing to work. And so achieving your goal and buying that is a great thing. Then we teach them to go in and open savings accounts uh, so that which many of these kids and their families, this is the first time they've ever been into a financial institution, which that's a great thing. And then asking them to turn around and reinvest. And, and that has, uh, that's one of the things that makes our program so interesting that for the money that we spend to run the program, there's actually more money coming back into the community, into a whole wide variety of programs from environmental and elderly to the homeless, than is actually spent to run the program, and that money's coming back from the kids. You know, from our perspective, um, social entrepreneurship is growing very, very wide. Uh, we see it in a lot of other countries, but even here in the United States, again, our site teams go out and identify audiences in need, so they get to pick who they actually work with. I'll give you an example from Belmont University. They were the 2010 USA National Champion Team. One of their projects, for instance, they worked with a project called 147 Million Orphans. They worked with two women in Nashville who had a passion to adopt children, and they went through an experience that uh, they found it very difficult to adopt children from other countries. Uh, they said the paperwork took an awful long time, uh, the accessibility to the children, they had a lot of concerns with their uh, education and nutrition uh, activities going on. These two individuals said, how can we help and how can we adopt children along the way and help other people? The women decided to create a garment um, campaign which started with t-shirts. They ended up uh, working with refugees in the Nashville area. Uh, they created a, a sewing type company to create t-shirts as well as handbags and some other products to make money. The women vowed they only keep 50% of the money. The other 50% would go into uh, the social entrepreneurship cause of adoptions. Uh, that money goes to uh, three different countries to help with educating uh, children and caring for them and helping with American citizens to uh, work on adoptions. That's just one example. We have thousands of projects. Uh, I will mention in your packets, you do have one brochure about Scythe, but if you go to our website, we have a lot of really great examples all around the world, even some videos that show how we're working on social entrepreneurship to improve the quality of life and standard of living for others. Uh, thank you very much along the same lines. In uh, CEO, we have uh, several sessions now in the annual conference on, on social marketing. And, and I would imagine the, uh, the students who are seated here, uh, as well as the university uh, teachers, uh, I, I think we're all keenly aware that, that there's a tremendous uh, interest today in social entrepreneurship. And, uh, and uh, whether social or, or for-profit, uh, we, we want to encourage entrepreneurial activity and entrepreneurial mindsets. Uh, to, you know, I, I think this is uh, definitely a growth, high growth area. I definitely feel a need to put my social entrepreneur creds on the table, uh, which is that actually making sense. The International is a social enterprise that I started as a micro entrepreneur and I'm living in New York. It is now a multi million dollar a year um, organization. <laughs> Um, in the technical assistance work that Making Sense provides to schools and other school programs and ministries of education around the world, the, the content we're providing for entrepreneurship also has a social entrepreneurship component. And I think one thing that's, that one of the reasons it's quite easy to do that is that what we see, have identified is the kinds of skills that young people need to be successful, you know, for-profit business owners, 
are the same as those that are needed to be successful social enterprise um, you know, managers and, 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 and successful kind of growth-oriented leaders of, of, of organizations. One challenge I'd like to throw back to the social enterprise community that's in this room is also getting comfortable with the idea that not every, that, that, it's, that <coughs> social enterprises could be for-profit businesses, for example, and that merely, you know, being an entrepreneur, creating value in your community, creating jobs, um, is a social value in itself. And I think sometimes, I would say in the, in the education community, there's more comfort with sort of pure and dure social entrepreneurship, because it's less about M-O-N-E-Y, and that there's a greater comfort level there, and that sort of so some of the social enterprise community could do well to get more comfortable with the for-profit business concept, which might be a better choice for the young people who are you know, in the program. Me too, me too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I think in, in general, uh, and, and I guess uh, you know, we have a, a real focus on spending, saving, investing, and sharing. And in fact, they've built it within our programs, social entrepreneurship as a, an outcome of, of, this, of learning business acumen. Uh, but, you know, we, we don't, I don't think any of us up here have a corner on the market, so uh, I wouldn't want you to hold back. I mean, I think, I think uh, you know, everybody needs to be moving in that direction. But more importantly, and I think the purpose of this conference, it is networking with each other uh, and, and to share, sharing what we're doing, because I think we're all doing a lot of the same things, but maybe a lot of different things. And I think learning from each other is really going to, at the end of the day, be what helps us promote what we're doing even more strongly. I, I, I mean, our entrepreneurship is moving beyond the business schools, as all you well know. And the more entrepreneurship leaves the business schools, uh, the more the more you have uh, students who want to create social enterprises, urban planning, or you know, wherever you, you need, uh, might, might arise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Ted Gondor is a student at University of Chicago, has a great financial literacy program for inner city students. Thank you, Michael. Um, my question is geared mainly towards Fiona and Michael uh, regarding barriers to entry for, uh, for youth that are trying to start uh, ventures. Uh, in my experience uh, in high school, I was driven by climate change uh, and I wanted to do something about it, so I started a high school club. Uh, through various existing infrastructure networks at the high school level, I was able to scale that to 35 high schools across California in a matter of two years. That instilled in me a belief that I could change the world. And I think a lot of, a lot of entrepreneurship is about belief and optimism. Um, and when you're, when you're young and when your peers are dragging you down and when teachers, uh, don't, when teachers aren't on board with your entrepreneurial visions, it's very easy to get discouraged. Um, and I'm just, I'm just curious if, if maybe everybody on the panel or maybe just Fiona and Michael, um, if you could kind of uh, talk about barriers to entry and the trade-offs between, say, a lemonade stand and like a nonprofit venture where money's not involved, but it's more friendly, you can scale it faster, uh, the risks are lower. Um, what, are, what are the trade-offs there, and how do you see that in terms of encouraging entrepreneurship? I don't know if this is going to respond directly to your question, but I do think that there's, with the enthusiasm and energy and passion, creativity and quality that we're all bringing to entrepreneurship programming. I think, depending on who the market segment is that we're targeting, um, and what I mean by that is, you know, we need to slice and dice our, our markets. So it's one thing to be sort of planting the seeds of entrepreneurship and encouraging and maintaining entrepreneurial thinking and skills in high school students. And it's something different to be working, for example, with high school dropouts where the goal of that program is business startup. So I think depending on what your goal is of your entrepreneurship program along that spectrum of like awareness, business startup, you know, which is different from income generating activities, I think as you move higher up that continuum of seeking business startup and growth that may, for example, require capital that could be a loan from friends and family or from a bank or the use of savings, there becomes an even greater responsibility on us because we're asking young people who have limited, often professional and kind of life skill development to take on enormous risk. 
and we need to be prudent in that. I mean, how many people in this room have started a business? And how many people have had a failed business? Okay, so I think we kind of meet the average. You know, and, and anyway, so I just wanted to, to make that point that I think it depends who your market segment is, and then we need to be prudent about the kind of you know, risk we're encouraging young people to take on and make sure that they're prepared and educated about that risk. So you're probably going to do a better job of answering the question. We're talking about entrepreneurship and, and how important it is in America today. But every single job in America was created by an entrepreneur. I mean, all the big companies were created by entrepreneurs, and we have a history of that, that over the last, uh, pick it, 40 years, we've kind of lost that. Whether it's because of entitlement, because we did so extraordinarily well as a, a country, we began, began to begin to just expect it. So what we're having to do as a nation is to relearn tools that we have always used. And you know, clearly there's no shortage of great ideas. They're, they're everywhere. Uh, and it, it takes entrepreneurs that can see the vision, that can communicate that vision, to work with folks, engineers, and others that can bring that together. Um, what it really is, is understanding intersections of interest. In other words, find people that think the way you do and that have a vested interest in that answer. Whether that's dealing with your professor that's trying to teach you something, you just have to figure out how what you're doing meets or exceeds what it is that they're looking for. And, and in every single industry, there are folks that are willing to put in risk capital in order to make that work. So I, I don't see it as, uh, as it, it being hard to find capital. It's just you gotta know the places to look and, and find the people that, that for a whole host of reasons want to do the same thing you're doing. They just came to it maybe from a different angle.